Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I try not to write smaller than that. I hope you can, you can read this. So my story begins like, like many other stories in this conference uh, with Dirk and uh, in the 1990s. We met, uh, I came across a paper by him and uh, David and he had this fancy idea to associate knots to some interesting numbers. And for the first time for me, it was the idea that numbers are more than just numbers, which is sort of a very modern view on numbers. So I was absolutely fascinated by these numbers and these ideas, and I tried to calculate them right away. Um, but to, to cut a long story short, I found myself some 10 years ago in Berlin sharing an office with Francis Brown. And actually nobody except uh, Dirk was really a distinguished uh, quantum field theorist at that time. So we started working and uh, the better part of the, ten, of the last 10 years, I spent setting up theories that allows me to actually calculate these numbers. And these theories, there are actually three theories. So we need theories. And the first theory is, uh, which I call graphical functions. And this is recently, this is with uh, Michi Borinsky. And uh, I should say that there is uh, pretty independently these functions have been developed by many people in super young Mills theory, and they do really amazing things there. But I have a purely mathematical view on these functions here. So this is the theory one. You need a second theory to express these. These are amplitudes. You want to express, uh, express these amplitudes in terms of functions that you can handle. And these functions are generalized. single-valued uh, hyperlocks. Uh, G S V H. And the third theory is sort of an add-on. It's a DIMRAC version of this DIMRAC extension that you may want to have if you have subdivergent graphs to handle. And these are the three theories and uh, they are now being published. Um, and uh, I should say, uh, this is a sort of a special setup. So you can't do every quantum field theory calculation in this setup, but I think uh, if it uh, is possible to do a quantum field theory uh, calculation within the setup, then it's typically more efficient than, than other methods. So it's kind of a special tool. And uh, what did we achieve, the results? There was one most prominently is this uh, Galois coaction. Uh, Galois, con uh, Galois coaction, the, the, the coaction conjectures. or principle or cosmic Galois group. Um, this is what I got after, you know, you, you do these calculations and you immediately see that there's this structure going on. So everything what I did in this direction is just doing this, these stupid calculations and, and look at them and then you immediately see that there's this, this structure. Uh, and there was even a, a calculation at seven loops which was missing, which I couldn't do with my methods. I had calculations up to 11 loops, but there was one particularly interesting seven loop graph missing, missing and that was done by Eric. And uh, I should say that uh, all the, the credit for, for trying to understand these things is due to Francis Brown and now many others. So I only stumbled over these things and understanding them is, is due to Francis Brown and, and many others. But at least I got him thinking about these things. 
Um, then you can prove something sometimes. There's the, the proof of the zigzag conjecture. And this is a conjecture by David Broadhurst and the Kreimer, and it took 17 years to prove this. So you can really do some mathematics. And uh, then if you use this, this third part, this add-on, then you can do uh, renumerization functions. Functions. And uh, I started, uh, before I actually did this calculation, so I was telling it's possible to do this, it's just straightforward. And then I thought it should, as a, as a proof of concept, I should at least do some six loop five to the four. Uh, but the tricky thing about these calculations is they're kind of a weird sort of fun. So when you start doing these, you always try to do more and more and more. So I had these six loop very quickly and then I thought, okay, I do seven loops. That was not that quickly anymore. So I had seven loops five to the four which means I have the beta function, the gamma function, the mass gamma function, and I have the self energy. Um, I started recently doing some work on eight loops beta, eight loops gamma. I don't really know why I actually doing this. I think I'm, I'm mostly doing this because, because I can do this. So it's just, you know, you know what to do and so you just start doing it whatsoever, you know? And um, there's more uh, recently uh, with Michi Gorinsky, it was possible to extend these calculations to uh, higher dimensions. So we look at phi to the three in six dimensions. And we got five loops very quickly. And six loops, yeah, maybe in the future, but I, I won't do this alone. I need me to do this with me. And then there was a proposal on QED, six loops. That, that was only a proposal and that was rejected because it wasn't interesting enough. So this is more as canceled, but uh, one could definitely try to do these things. You only know in the very end if you succeed because they, if, it, if there's a single graph that you can't do, then, then you're, you're, you're stuck. Um, okay, so if you have interest in doing these things, I don't think that I do this, this alone in the near future, but maybe if somebody is interested, it would be good to, to help somebody doing this. And what else did we have? Uh, for results, we had something else, so I won't write it down because there's no space on the blackboard anymore. They, we had the C2 environment, which is nothing to do with these things. So we proved that uh, with, with, uh, together with Francis Brown, we proved that there is a K3 in five of the four and there are higher dimensional uh, geometries and there's modularity, such things, and there was other spin-offs like uh, the single valued multiple C values, which is also due to uh, Francis Brown mostly. But I got him motivated to look at these things from, from my calculations. So I want to spend the time to explain one, two, and three. And uh, yeah, but I won't do it in a very mathematical way because I don't have enough blackboard space to actually write down all the details. So that will be a, a birthday talk, a bit casual. And I try to explain the concepts and uh, how they emerged and, and where they came from. And uh, although I do these graphical functions now for, for some 10 years, I still remember the very second when they were born. So it's the graphical functions here. The very second when they were born, uh, I was walking with Francis to the S-Bahn in Berlin. And uh, he was, I was thinking about these numbers. I wanted to have numbers, but he had a very parametric mind. Uh, we saw that he still has sort of a parametric mind. And he explained to me why this is uh, good to, to have a parametric mind is because 
even if you look at pure numbers, it's good to have parameters because with parameters, you can do more things than with, than with pure numbers. You have differential equations and stuff like that. And if you're interested in numbers, you can specialize values and you get the numbers back. So it's always good to have uh, numbers. But I liked, uh, I liked my uh, position space approach that I had beforehand. And I wanted to stay as closely as possible to quantum field theory. And this parametric space always seemed a bit artificial to me. So I didn't want to use real tricks like this, this, this Schwinger trick. I just wanted to stay as closely as possible to quantum field theory. And I personally like the position space because the primary rules are the simplest in, in position space. So I said to, my, uh, said to myself, okay, Francis, you want a parameter. I get you a parameter, but I stay in position space. So I started with zero scales. I say, okay, get one scale, but one scale doesn't do the job because one scale is trivial. It's just, uh, it's just uh, the scale dependence is just uh, a power. So there's nothing new happening. So I need a second scale. I need a two scale processes. And that's it. I have just one, one parameter, not for every edge a parameter, just a single parameter. And uh, that's, the birth of the of, of graphical functions. So the setup is as follows. Uh, we have position space, space. Uh, in position space, you rather want to have the mass equal to zero, in particular, if you want to do many loop calculations because it's just too complicated and the propagator is not algebraic uh, for mass not equal to zero. And uh, you have a dimension D, which originally it was four, but now it's uh, four or larger than four, but it has to be even still. Um, hey, Oliver, someone, one of the attendees has raised their hand and yes. uh, Frederick also suggested you could erase your title if you want a little more space. But so. Uh, erase my title, yeah, you can do this. And Jonathan, do you have a question? Well, maybe not. Okay, I don't know. The question will have to appear in text form later and I'll pass it on if it does. Discussion afterwards. So I'm in position space. I have a two scale process and two scale is two real numbers. And the idea is that these two numbers should fit into the complex plane because in mathematics doing things in the complex plane is always an advantage. Um, we can see this geometrically. There's two ways to do this. You can either have invariance to fit in the complex plane, or you have it geometrically. Like in position space, we have vertices, and we have you need three vertices to be fixed to have a two-scale process. And the three vertices which are fixed, they span a plane. Wherever you, however you arrange these three vertices, they always span a plane. And I, this plane, I want to be the, the complex plane. And I, I move the complex plane and I choose the scale in such a way that one of these d-dimensional uh, vectors in, in this, of these three vertices is the zero. The other one is the one in the complex plane. And the third one is my parameter, my, my only parameter, which is now a complex number. Uh, yeah, so that, that's the idea and I have this uh, to, to have this graphically, I have uh, the three vertices uh, are get the labels zero, one, and Z. Although in, as an amplitude, they are d-dimensional vectors that could still be the origin uh, in d-dimensional space. This is a unit vector and this is an arbitrary vector. And I give you examples right away to know um, the first non-trivial example is this graph. Uh, so you integrate, you, you just calculate the amplitude of this Feynman graph in position space. You integrate over this internal vertex. You don't integrate over zero, one, and Z. And then you interpret the result as a function on the complex plane. And the result is four times I times B of Z over z minus z bar in four dimensions. Well, this is not this d. This is the Bloch-Wigner dialog. 
blau. Mignon, dialog. Um, this is in four dimensions. So that's a bit confusing now. This is uh, E equals four. The dimension is four, and this is the block Wigner dialog. Well, that looks like an interesting function, I thought. Uh, I should say that uh, because John had it yesterday in his talk, by uniqueness, uh, that in, in six dimensions, you can calculate this in any dimension. In six dimensions, the result is even simpler. So in six dimensions, you get Z, Z bar, Z minus one, and Z bar minus one. And this is uniqueness. And you can calculate in eight dimensions and 10 dimensions and 200 dimensions, whatever you want. Um, so I have another example. What happens if I add an edge between zero and Z in this graph? I get an extra position space propagator and in four dimensions, the position space propagator is the absolute value of the difference squared. And if I translate this to complex numbers, what I get is a Z times Z bar. And here you see one of the benefits of working on the complex plane. What in D dimension is a quadric, like the propagator, becomes a pair of straight lines in two dimensions. So you want, generally, you want to get things as linear as possible. And this definitely helps. So, uh, yeah, that's the idea. In, in, in six dimensions, you would get uh, a square of this set times that part. You get this. Uh, so you want to know what are the general properties. That was the first question that I had. Okay, of these functions, how will they look like in general? And uh, just let me say it again. It's important, although we only work on the complex plane, the graphical function has the full information of the, of the amplitude to it because there can't happen anything else. Everything happens on this plane, which is spanned by the three external vectors. So what are the general properties? So I erase the example. There are three general properties of uh, different complexity to prove. So there's one. This is what you get right away. I call these graphical functions F indexed by the graph. And what you get is a residual symmetry. Uh, you get a reflection symmetry. Uh, Z bar is the complex conjugate of Z. Uh, I should have said this before. And it's also a real function, of course, because everything is real, but that's not so important. This is property one, you get this for free. Property two is already a little bit harder. Um, FG for any graph, for, for every graph, FG is a real analytic. So it will, be, will never be an analytic function. It's a real analytic function. And it's a single wave function. Function on C with two singularities, zero and one. And when you think of numbers and you see all these fancy numbers with all roots of unity and then stuff like that, or elliptic or K3 surfaces coming up, it was a surprise to me that you, for every graph G, you only have singularities is zero, one, and you have one at infinity. So this is due to uh, Martha Goltz, Eric, and myself uh, in 2012, I, I guess. That's a mathematical proof. And then something else, which is very important, although it looks a little bit technical, you get uh, something, you get, uh, you look at the singularities, zero, one, and infinity, and you get something that I call log uh, Laurent expansions, single value log Laurent expansions at zero, one, and you also get one at infinity. And having an expansion at infinity means that you actually not, don't want to leave, live on the complex plane, but on the Riemann sphere in some sense. It's sort of a, a meromorphic property on the, on the Riemann sphere. And how do they look like? I only write it down for set equals zero. 
um, so you get a sum uh, L equals a finite sum, and it goes to the number to the internal vertices, but that doesn't matter, it's a finite sum. And then you get infinite sums, and M and M bar are just uh, uh, integers, and they are bounded from below by some M zero. So get some coefficients, C naught, L, M, M bar, and these are real. You get, because it's single layered, you get a log Z, Z bar. You can't have a log Z alone. That would never be single layered. And you take this to the power L. And then you have uh, just uh, a, a typical Laurent expansion. You get Z to the power M and Z bar to the power M bar. So it's, it's a little bit of a bad notation. Z bar is the complex conjugate of Z, but M bar is not the complex conjugate of M. It's just two independent integers. And it's very important to have this lower bound on M and M bar. So if I uh, do some examples, give you some examples to see what this, what this property does. It is, uh, for example, what is not, what does not have the property is something like one over Z minus Z bar. Because if you expand in Z, you get more and more negative powers in Z bar. So this will never be, uh, never have this property three. And uh, what is okay actually, but you have to think about it, is the block Wigner dialog over Z minus Z bar. This has the property three. And this is actually uh, in a recent paper, will be a recent paper with uh, Michi Borinsky. And myself, and uh, the proof is more or less finished, except for interchanging uh, sum with an integral, which is a tricky thing. So it's still a little bit in progress, but it's clear that, that we have this. Okay. So that's a very important property. So not everything uh, that you can write down with, say, z minus z bar in the denominator is, has this property. You need to have a numerator that cancels the singularity on the real axis uh, in the denominator, and the block Wigner dialog is such a numerator. The next thing that you want to know is how do I actually calculations with these with these numbers? How do I calculate them? But before I do this. I, uh, I want to show that uh, you get you get these numbers uh, that I was interested in from the very beginning from these functions. And uh, how to get periods is the, the trivial way you can set z equals zero, one, or infinity. And that's what we did for the for the zigzag uh, conjecture. We actually used uh, a very recent theorem by Don Zagni, so I should save us. But there's a better way to do this. This is actually a complicated way to do this because you have to calculate a uh, graphing the function, which is sort of too complicated. You don't have to have this. Because if you substitute, you, you did too much, and then you, you restrict to a point, and then you lose something that you have calculated beforehand. So the better way to do this is to integrate over z. So you, you have a two-dimensional integral over z, over z, and this is an effective integral. It is over the complex plane, but it's not the normal integral. You get a special measure from projecting everything down to the complex plane. And there's this example that we, we have. This is uh, we calculate this graph of the function. And uh, the period, if you integrate it over z, you get the period. And this is the integral with this effective, this effective integral of uh, the block wigner dialog, which we had in the previous example. And now we have the z minus z bar. And then we have the z z bar from, from, from this edge here. And we have z minus one and z bar minus one from this edge. And we have an, a factor of one from this edge. And you see everything is linear, so you may guess that you can do this integral, and this is 6 C of 3. That's the wheel of three spokes. Another very nice example, which is very easy with this method, is the K34. So you have uh, 
four vertices on, on one side and three on the other side and you join them in such a way that everything is connected from the left to the right. So these are the seven vertices here. This is the K three, four. And now you have, you have several choices to, to uh, choose where you want to have your uh, one, uh, zero, one, and Z. But here it's very convenient to have this here. And you immediately see that the, the period gives uh, D to Z, this effective integral over C. And uh, if you look at this amplitude, like uh, you integrate over this vertex, but it does not connect to these vertices here. It only connects, connects to zero, one, and Z. So this is actually the fourth power of what I did beforehand. It's a four ID of Z over Z minus Z bar to the power four. Maybe I have to think about it for a while, but you see that this vertex is not directly connected to this, so that the, the function factorizes its a fourth power. The exam that I had before, and the result is something which has a theta three five. Here. Okay, so I was glad that I could do these things very easily. Uh, but uh, in general, you have to in general you have to be able to calculate the graphical functions and more complicated fun graphical functions than what I had beforehand. So you want to have a strategy how to calculate these graphical functions. If I couldn't calculate these functions, then the theory would be pretty useless. So lots of effort went into the finding ideas how to calculate these graphical functions. But there's a very uh, straightforward way to do if you get started. Or graphical functions. So there are some trivial steps that you can do, like adding an edge between zero and Z or between one and Z or zero and one. You, you can even permute zero, one and Z and you know what's happening on the function side. And there's completion, which I skip here. So you can use conformal symmetry to add another external vertex in infinity. Uh, but to get something substantial, you, you need to do uh, some integration. And in position space, and that's also a reason I like position space, you can use the Klein Gordon equation. And uh, because we have zero mass, it's only a Laplace equation. So you want to solve an equation like Laplace, a d dimensional Laplace of some function is some other function. And in practice, this would be uh, a more complicated graphical function. And this is a simpler graphical function. This is the way you, if you think of an, of an amplitude, the Laplace, uh, here is makes a propagator collapse to a delta function and the, the edge shrinks. So this is the way to contract edges. Or if you solve this equation, then you can kind of uh, graphs with the extra edges from the smaller graph. Um, because we work in two dimensions, uh, this gets down to an effective uh, to an effective equation. So we get an, an effective uh, Laplacian. And uh, there are some trivial rescalings that you want to do. So I skip this. Uh, but essentially, what you need to do in the complex plane is to solve this differential equation. Um, this is the Laplacian, and now you have to solve uh, a similar equation uh, where these are slightly rescaled functions. So that's what you want to solve. And because there might be some mathematicians uh, to listen to this talk, I, uh, although I don't really need it, I, I want to say something about this Laplace because there's some nice mathematical structure going on. And this is interesting enough. This is uh, the Laplacian on the, on the hyperbolic space, the upper half plane. 
uh, model of the of the hyperbolic space. So there is a factor of minus 16 times this subduction on the upper half space of hyperbolic space. I don't know what graphical functions have to do with hyperbolic space. This is the only connection that I have. Uh, but more interestingly, the whole the whole effective the whole effective uh, Laplacian is actually a Casimir minus d minus three, the dimension minus three squared uh, of a SI two C C Lie algebra. And um, which you get if you consider these differential operators z to the n dz plus z bar to the n dz bar uh, for n equals 0, 1, 2. So these uh, three differential operators, they generate an SI2C Lie algebra. And if you calculate uh, the, the Casimir, this is the Casimir of this Lie algebra, then you see that you can express this uh, effective Lagrangian in this form. So you expect at least the homogeneous solutions of this uh, differential equation have, having something to do with the representation. Uh, but we only knew this after we have already solved this uh, differential equation. So you, the, the, the trick is you want to find a general solution of this differential equation, uh, delta effective of f equals g. Uh, for any dimension by only taking primitives. And normally I thought this is hopeless. So I, for a long time, I stuck to a D equals four, then this is gone. And this is trivial. You can just integrate with respect to Z bar and then you integrate with respect to Z and you're finished. So D equals four is trivial. And I thought it would be impossible to go beyond D equal three, but then Michi Berinsky entered the the game and he was uh, ingenious and stubborn enough to, to try this. I didn't even try to look for a solution because I thought it was hopeless. And uh, what we achieved is uh, a closed form for the solution, the general solution, closed form for the general solution. in the space of single valid functions with uh, singularities at 0, 1, and infinity. Solution of this delta f, f equals g. <clears throat> well, that was a surprise to me. And this is, uh, I have to say it again, this uh, Niki Borinsky played a very important role in finding the solution. So this, but this is only the first step if you want to use this the klein gordon equation for calculating graphing function. This is the first step. You want to have a general solution. Well, that's not enough because you want to have a special solution. So you have to control the kernel. There's a huge kernel here in this differential equation. If d equals four, then the kernel is just uh, the sum of a holomorphic function plus an anti-holomorphic function. In general, it's more complicated. We know the kernel and you have to control the kernel. Uh, so the next thing uh, we did is looking which function of in this kernel has the property, the general property is G1, G, uh, general property is one, two, three of, of graphical functions. And the big surprise is that there's uh, only a unique graphical function in this uh, pre image of this differential operator. So the, the kernel is trivial. Trivial in the space of functions with this property three, this very important technical property that we have for graphical functions. So because I know that my, my function my, my, my graphical function has this property three. I have no problem with the kernel and I get a unique answer solving this, uh, this differential equation. And the third step is um, 
the third step is uh, find a function space where you can do this uh, calculation here, the function space. And this function space is the generalized single valued hyperbox to do actual calculations. And this I want to do in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, tell you something about the general uh, single valued hyperbox. There's just two more things I want to say about graph the function. I just say it verbally. Um, there are more identities that you have. There are many more identities, and there are still identities to be found. There's this amazing uh, fishnet conjecture by uh, Benjamin Basso and Lance Dixon, which I can't understand so far mathematically. And uh, the other thing is, I do have a thing in Euclidean space, but uh, you also get the same result from Minkowski space, because in Euclidean space, you have Z and Z bar is a complex conjugate. And in Minkowski space, uh, with Z and Z bar, they would be real. And independent. So with the, with, the, with the result, you have both worlds, the Euclidean and the Minkowski world. And, and for some uh, consideration, it's even good to have Z and Z bar as independent complex variables. And it starts also with the story. and. Uh, most prominently, the story was Francis Brown started, it was a kind of a lucky coincidence, to analyze functions which are single valued and uh, are multi polylux. So he had a theory of single valued multi polylux, was in a paper which was never even been published, it was a beautiful paper. And he used generating functions. So it's, it's extremely beautiful. You have the Ahara reaction in there. But as beautiful as it is, it's not very practical because in generating functions, you have the whole lot, the whole universe of these objects to do a single calculation. So I thought uh, if you have a single valued multi polylog, which I used first to do these calculations, uh, I need a procedure to get a primitive without having the full generating uh, function. So the idea was to corner the single valued multi products by two errors, and one is the, the integral, the single valued integral itself, and the other one is the complex conjugate. I want to, to write it as a, a single valued integral and a single valued integral vector z bar. So here's something like dz, single valued multiple polylox, and here is dz bar of single valued multiple polylox. And I need some space here of this again. And the idea, the obvious idea is to have a commutative, uh, to have a commutative square at that, this is that bar, because uh, you, you want to kind of undo this interval, you have bz bar, and then you get a weight drop, and then you move up doing the single valued integral bz. So this should cancel this, and this should give this. That's the idea that should commute more or less, but it does not really commute on the nose. Or what you need, you need uh, two more errors. So it's a hexagon to make this commute and you need projections on the residue free part. And this is the anti residue. So this kills residue. Pi, and pi bar, they kill anti for the bar residues. And with this commutative hexagon, it's very easy to, con to construct these uh, single valued multiple products explicitly. So, start with a, a function here, subtracting the residue is no problem. Um, and here, the whole mystery of single valued integration is the anti holomorphic part. And the whole mystery of uh, single valued integration with respect to z bar is the holomorphic part. So, if you, if you intersect the mysteries, you are left with a constant. And that solves the problem. But uh, the single valid multipolylox is not what I wanted to have because uh, it's not it's not enough. You know, you, you get more functions. You want to have more functions. You want to have differential forms like dz, something like a z z bar. You want to have bilinears b z plus z z bar plus d, and uh, 
So one example would be this dz over z minus z bar, and this d, yeah, d of z, z over z minus z bar. Uh, so we get this quite frequently, and uh, you you also may have may use the fact that you have this log Laurent. So you get the log Laurent expansions with the three, this property three. You may impose this for this function that you want. You have these differential forms, you have the log law forms, but it's expansions at the singularities, and then you want to find primitives. And uh, it took me a while to figure it out, but the solution of this problem is to ignore it. So you just use the same the same thing here, and you just replace single value my products by generous single value my products. And the thing works. So this is one of the lucky circumstances where you can solve a problem by ignoring it. So I, I feel obliged in the current situation to say that that is not always a good approach, but here it worked. Uh, and then you get a very efficient way to calculate these general single bit hyperlocks. So one example would be this. If you, if you, if you integrate this function, we, we saw that this is in three. This gives, uh, uh, if you integrate this respect to dz, take the primitive, then you get a general single valid hyperlock. Whereas this, if you integrate this, it's not good because there's no three, and this is not a general single valid hyperlock. You can extend these objects to these things, but they are sort of single valid, sort of meaningless because they kind of is catched at the real axis where there's a singularity. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, uh, about uh, generalized single valid hyperlocks. And if it's possible, I would use another five minutes to say a little bit about DIMREC to sort of close the cycle coming back to Dirk at the end of the talk. Go it's, ahead. Yeah, it's sort of straightforward. So I can't really tell a story about these things because you just do it the way uh, you naturally would do this. And uh, the first thing that you observe that this delta effective in Z, uh, you get an extra term plus two epsilon Z minus Z bar, uh, DZ minus DZ bar. And to actually prove this, this is a naive answer. That's what you get naively, just uh, by substituting the dimension in the form that I had beforehand to d minus epsilon. Uh, but you have to prove that this works and the uh, master goes proved it in his master thesis uh, uh, in parametric space where everything is well defined. And then you just expand in epsilon and everything goes through. So what you do is uh, you, you get a theory, you get Laurent series in epsilon every order in epsilon is, looks like a, a graphical function, an ordinary graphical function. So you use the standard, use the standard uh, properties of graphical functions, of graphical functions. And the next thing you use is some extra stuff, which works only for some orders in epsilon. That's actually quite powerful. These standard properties of graphical in this work all order like uh, this, this uh, kind of solving the Klein-Gordon equation. But there are some, you can do a sort of approximation. You take a subgraph, replace it by a simpler graph, which happens to have the same expansion epsilon up to a certain order. And if you're only interested in, in some orders in epsilon, and if everything is not singular around this subgraph, then you can replace this and you get a simpler graph, and then you can hope to calculate the simpler graph or graphs with the standard methods. 
And what you get is a reduction in the number. So many of the graphs you just do right away without thinking and the complexity of the Of, uh, of the of the graphs so that you need. So think of seven lips by the four. You have some whatever ten thousand graphs you want to do uh, for the beta function. You calculate uh, ninety five percent of it right away, and then you have uh, five percent problems with these methods. So you can't get anywhere with graphical functions and uh, with the standard properties and with these uh, substitutions. But the problem sort of still reduces the graphs to some sort of kernel. And uh, so this is one of the major benefits of using graphical functions for these calculations. They just come collapse to something much smaller. And this much smaller objects, they are much more appropriate to use some external techniques if you want. And there's hyperint by Eric. Uh, which is sort of hard to use because it's normally time and memory consuming, but it's still very, very helpful if nothing else works. And then what you should do, what I haven't really done yet uh, to full extent, is you should you, you should renormalize your graphical function. Um, what I mean with renormalize, you can calculate them as parasites and epsilon, but it's more efficient to sort of subtract subdivisions. Imagine you have such a subgraph in a graphical function, a bubble with diversion four dimensions. So you want to add and subtract a graph where you re-rooted uh, an edge. You take this and you add this again. And uh, so you, you haven't changed anything, but now you have reduced the problem because this is simpler here because you can integrate out this, this vertex. This is simpler and this is less divergent. And uh, less divergence means uh, that you have less orders in epsilon that you want to calculate. And the, the number two becomes much more powerful on, on these less divergent graphs. So you really gain a lot doing this. And then you're back at, uh, Contrima uh, Hopf algebra of renormalization, which was very prominent in this uh, workshop. And uh, you also have this paper by Dirk and by Francis. Uh, how to reroute these edges to get uh, rid of the, of the uh, singularities. And it's, it's important to know that even if you don't fully solve the problem, even a partial solution is very helpful. You don't have to solve the problem altogether. Every step that you do in the right direction is good. You also have other techniques and uh, some very important property of this graphical function is that they are very complementary to other techniques. So what is hard to renormalize is easy to calculate from for graphical functions right away with techniques one or two. Or what is hard for hyperin is easy to do uh, for graphical functions and the other way around. So that's, that's sort of the fun of it. So I come to my conclusions. And the conclusions is, thank you, Jeff. And thank you to everybody else in the community. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you for your talk. Thanks, Oliver. So uh, there are a number of questions in the Q&A over the course of the talk, some of which are, are still sort of live. And so I would start with Thibaut Damour asked if you have results in odd dimensions, notably d equals c. Yeah, that's, that's a big problem. We don't have anything in odd dimensions so far. But if you look at this uh, SL2C Lie algebra, so there is maybe some hope if there's a, a way that the, the fact that you can solve this differential equation in even dimension has to do with the, with the Lie algebra structure, then you have a hope to extend it to odd dimensions. But we weren't able, we haven't really tried very hard uh, because we don't need any quantum field theory, but for classical problems, it would be very helpful to have something in two dimensions. But we weren't able to, it's not easy. It's not a trivial thing to, to 
to solve once you, even if you have the even solutions. All right. Uh, Slava Rychkov had a few different questions um, and I've allowed them to speak in case they would like to just ask them directly. Should I go ahead? Yeah, we can hear you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks uh, for a nice talk. I had, uh, so what were the questions? So I got some answers on, um, uh, on Q and A, so I'll only ask those which I didn't learn to answer that. So when you deal with a high order graph, there may be a few choices for what for who to call Z. Yes. That's so the, that's what's the power? That's the power of the technique that you can yeah. use Z everywhere you want, like even zero, one, and Z. So you have many options. There's not a unique way you have to calculate the graph. So you yeah. can choose the best way. This is very helpful. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and okay, I finally have a general question. Since you mentioned the Cosmic Gala group, and I don't really like have a very good idea what it is, but uh, I heard some people say that uh, one should think of this Cosmic Gala group as some sort of new symmetry of a quantum field theory. Um, so uh, I was wondering if, well, if, if this were the case, then it better have some meaning beyond perturbation theory. Yes. So I was wondering if you have any comments about that. Uh, if, so uh, I think how should I think of this cosmic group? Is it just some purely not, perturbative thing or does it have some non-perturbative meaning? I don't think it has a, uh, until now, I don't think it really has a physical interpretation, but it is a very practical thing to have. You have a Galois coaction and you have some amplitude or period the coaction principle says whatever you calculate in quantum field theory, you want to, to know the coaction, uh, and you get something which is something again, or these are you know, spaces of, of functions or, or numbers, and you get something to run. And here is these are the Galois conjugates. And the, the coaction conjecture or the principles of the cosmic Galois group says. That it, this is very, very restrictive what you get here. You get only very few Galois conjugates. So it may be a symmetry, but because it's the dual of a symmetry, it, it, in, in practice, it's more like a restriction. Yeah? You're very limited what a quantum field theory result could look like. Because you know, if you calculate the Galois coaction, you have to have Galois conjugates, which are in a very restricted space, and typically you know the space because it's from lower orders. You have a feeling what it should be. For example, if you do five to the four periods, you just know that you get uh, again a five to the four period. And there's not so many around. So this is a huge restriction. Almost everything is ruled out by this coaction conjecture. So the way if you want to look at it practically, then it's a huge restriction of, of what type of results you if, if I can add just one thought, uh, I think from my experience, all we have done so far and what we have seen was always on a perturbative level. Yes. So you compute some Feynman graphs, you compute some amplitudes and n equals four, things like that. It's, it's a perturbative origin because that's where you have the motivic periods. So you have this motivic Galois theory. And, and I think the transition to, to the uh, non-perturbative setting is, is a very interesting, but at the present, uh, the kind of question where we don't really have much information because the, the mathematical structure changes, right? You, I don't know what the nature of these numbers is you get from uh, resumming the entire series. I mean, as we've seen in, in talks yesterday, right? This is a very different world of, uh, of integrals and special functions and so on. But at least, I mean, maybe one glimmer of hope uh, to get some understanding in that direction might be recent work that has been started um, also by physicists and, and also mathematicians are working. I mean, Francis Brown is in the audience. Maybe he can comment on that. Um, that there are ways like a perturbative series, right, as a formal series that incorporates many, many periods and all of their coefficients. And then you can look what does the Galois coaction do on coefficients. But there is, an, there is a program going on right now um, to define a Galois theory for these kind of full perturbation series without having to do the expansion. I mean, this is dreaming very wildly, and I don't really know if, if, if that will give you a physical uh, application for the resumed physics problem. But I, I'm just saying that there is work going on in mathematics that might give a meaning to a Galois coaction of a perturbation series. 
Can I, can I chip in with a very quick comment? Sorry to, to draw out this conversation. But um, it, it's a comment that was made in Alain Con's talk. And, and Galois called his theory the theory of ambiguity. And, and the idea is that if you say, if you write down square root of two, that doesn't make sense because um, there are two square roots of two. There's plus square root of two and there's minus square root of two. And that ambiguity naturally gives rise to a group action. And that group is the set of all, all ways of permuting the answer or all, all possible ambiguities. And, and sort of tautologically, anything in quantum field theory that is not where there has been some choice made, um, where there's some intrinsically some ambiguity will necessarily give rise to a group of symmetries, which is the group that permutes all the possible answers. Um, and so I have no idea, of course, how to make the, the cosmic Gato group as you understand it act non-perturbatively, but I think the, the spirit of it, the idea of it um, is uh, very encouraging that perhaps something like that does exist non-perturbatively. Are there other questions for Oliver? I also want to say that uh, your seven loop results on, uh, on the fight to the fourth are really having a lot of impact in the, uh, in the community which cares about the critical exponents. So if you can do the eight loops, then you said you don't really know why you do it, but I, mean, I think I think uh, you are really showing uh, the way that this epsilon expansion calculations, which have been stagnating for many many years, decades, that you are showing the way that they can actually be pushed. And even though there are other techniques nowadays to compute this critical exponents, it's great that the randomization group approach. Uh, still uh, is not running out of steam. So uh, yes. I, think, I think this is a, one of the motivations that maybe will as far allow as you to complete this great work. As far as I understood, there were even with the seven loop result was not so easy to get much better. Yeah. There's still some hope. I think the eta was the best. So the gamma function maybe has a certain value to, to calculate. David has a question. Yes, well, really directly following on from that, my understanding is that you don't need the Hopf algebra of the iterated uh, uh, subtraction of subdivergences for the beta function. If you can calculate the bare diagrams, yes. you just add them all up. I and don't, I don't, I don't think that's, that's But the great point. thing about the BPHC is it gives you, uh, in the old way that we did it, yes. gives you one loop for free. I mean, you know what I mean by that. So might you find yourself using R star at eight loops? There is an idea by, uh, I think Mikhail Kompanyets wanted to kind of implement R star to graphical functions calculations. So this is a very crude uh, thing that I did and I have a very crude Maple implementation. I do these seven, seven loop calculations. I, I never did, did more than I actually had to do to get the results, but it's not uh, done in any nice or complete way. So whatever you use, to do these much more complicated momentum space calculations, we could also use for uh, graphical functions and that makes it even more powerful. And the way I use this uh, concurrent Hopf algebra is not for remodernization because I just calculate the actual, uh, the actual periods to, to the, the order in epsilon that I need. So I took a very, very naive, uh, uh, naive approach to realization, but it's on the other hand a very practical tool for calculating these graphical functions. So I just yeah. use yeah. it not for realization, but just as a practical tool to, to get more results, to get rid of problems. And that's the good thing about this is that you don't have to have a full understanding of it because you know you have other tools and you only have to lift the problem above the barrier where you can do it with, with other methods. So even an incomplete, even like isolated divergences, if you handle isolated divergences, the, the simplest thing that you can do is very, very helpful for calculations of graphical function. And I have done very little in this direction. Thank you. All right, let's thank Oliver again. Thank you. Thank you.